Hi, welcome to the open space with Aura. I took a summer break like majority of us. And as you know, I keep repeating it. I intentionally disengage, don't hide, but disengage from all things social media, except this little channel, which um, I started with one idea to talk with people who inspire me, who I've heard of, seen or read and whose mind and way of thinking uh, connected with me in some way, in a few ways. And today's guest is one of these people, uh, a person of fascinating mind. And um, for me, that's the highest I can say about the person, the fascinating mind, uh, Joshua Mitchell, Dr. Joshua Mitchell. I would like you to introduce yourself to us the way you feel you want to. And before we keep going with our conversation, I want to tell our viewers that if you like what you see here, what you hear here, please share it with your friends as you feel appropriate. Dr. Mitchell, the stage is yours. Thank you, Aura. Please call me Josh. Josh. Uh, I, I am Joshua Mitchell. I have been a professor at Georgetown for 28 years. I'm also now affiliated with the Claremont Institute's Washington Center. And uh, what else could I say? I've, I'm an American, but I was born in Egypt. Some of my formative years were spent in the Middle East. I've spent the better half the last 15 years in the Middle East, but mostly I'm concerned about the afflictions of America. And I do believe that coming, moving back and forth between two cultures, you get a, a clear eyed view about some of the problems. Josh, I would like to ask you a few questions that keep coming to my mind. And um, I really would like to hear what you think. I grew up in a place of affliction of Soviet Union. I would say it was slow agony uh, and slow collapse, rotting and collapse of Soviet Union, disintegration of the big machinery. And uh, I would like to ask you, how do you see the state of what we call America, I see it as getting more and more fragmented, but, but what do I know? More and more fragmented, more and more polarized. And is there even a chance for this monolithic thing called America, if it were ever was that monolithic thing, maybe it, it was a myth, uh, to come together or it's impossible. So how would you see where we're at now and where we're moving toward? And if there are any preventative things that could be done or we are doomed? Uh, I, I generally don't like to think that we're doomed, but, but increasingly I'm very worried. It just looks like uh, not only are things falling apart overtly politically, kind of incompetence at the elite level, but it looks like all the institutions that we need in order to live well are slowly fraying on the edges. The families, families don't seem to work particularly well. Our educational system is falling apart. Uh, politics is clearly dysfunctional. We have an economy in which uh, we have growing divides between the few and the many, and, and those who are benefiting most don't seem to be too concerned about it. We have a profound problem of loneliness in our society as a whole, but I think especially among the young people who have a cheap substitute in Facebook and yet they go home, they fall asleep at night feeling terribly lonely or, or, or take drugs to keep their loneliness away. I think a lot of people would see all that. What I've added to this, uh, this conversation is um, the suggestion that one of the reasons why we're not trying to fix our institutions 
is because we're involved, as I say in this book I've recently written called American Awakening, we're involved in a kind of religious moment in America where the thing that seems to be most on people's minds is how they can escape from guilt. Uh, so I live in a small town, small college town, and, and I see uh, so many people putting Black Lives Matter signs on their front lawn. And I will be the first to suggest that, that there's a racial wound in America that needs to be fixed. So my criticism of Black Lives Matter is not because I don't think that there's a, a racial wound that has to be healed, but it seems to me that what's going on in, in so many people's hearts is a desperate need to suggest that they're pure, they're innocent, they're not guilty. Uh, it's, it's what I call a Passover ritual. You know, the story in the Old Testament is that uh, God told the Jews to paint the blood of innocence of an innocent lamb on their lintels of the door and death will pass them by. And Black Lives Matter signs in your front yard are something like that. You put a sign in your front yard that says, I don't deserve social death. I don't deserve to be canceled. Uh, and and then, then you're absolved of any responsibility. So instead of, instead of solving particular problems, instead of trying to heal our institutions, the only thing that so many people seem to be concerned with is how poisoned are these institutions? How can we erase them? So at the very moment we need to fortify them, we have half the population saying our families are heteronormative, our churches are homophobic, our country's poisoned because of systemic racism. At the very moment when we need to fix all these institutions and heal them, we have half the population that wants to destroy them. Uh, so that's, that is, I think, the deeper crisis. It's not simply that things are falling apart. It's that people want them to fall apart. That's I, a I have a question. Uh, speaking of Jewish tradition, I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm Russian Jew, which is worse. And I experienced a lot of real anti-Semitism toward me. And... Um, I, all, I always oriented myself, and more than that, when I came and I spent many years in the Middle East, like you are, living in Israel, um, ironically, I experienced some perverted kind of anti-Russian because I was considered Russian, <laughs> not real Jew. Right. <laughs> and people would tell me uh, offensive slurs, but somehow I always... I wouldn't take personal offense because I always knew that if I would count all expressions of anti-Semitism, I will probably have to disengage myself from 90% of great writers, yeah. of probably all great composers of Germany and Austria, yeah. because uh, all great thinkers, because to some degree that they were anti-Semite. So somehow, I had to make clear separation between uh, the expressions of anti-Semitism to, due to different reasons, historical and cultural, and the genius yeah. or the greatness of their minds, which is always for me the priority. I always choose the greatness of the mind versus the person who potentially could express anti-Semitic views. But that's me. But maybe we should somehow, somehow orient ourselves when we come to race to start separating these two things. Yeah, so the, the analogy for, for a lot of Americans is the founding fathers. Yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the Constitution and the founding documents of the American Republic are extraordinary documents. But it's true that Thomas Jefferson had slaves and Washington had slaves. <clears throat> and the Constitution itself has an allowance for slavery to continue in the South, probably because you had to make a, a terrible compromise in order to hold 13 states together that otherwise could not have been held together. Mm -hmm. So th the larger problem, in my view, <clears throat> is how do we view impurity, stain, transgression. And what's very interesting to me in the American debate between the left and the right, <clears throat> say on this 
1619 project, which you've probably heard about. The 1619 <laughs> project was put out <clears throat> in August of 2019 by the New York Times. And the argument was that the American founding was not this pure founding of 1776. It was a founding in, in 1619 in the Jamestown colony when slaves arrived. So that America from the very beginning was stained and impure. Now, how did, how did many conservatives respond to this? They responded to this by saying, no, America is pure. Now, what's interesting about these two seemingly different positions is, and I'm coming to you and the composers in a minute, what's interesting is that they both take for granted the same thing, namely that something can only be justified and loved if it's pure. And the conservatives say that, that America is pure, and, but, they, but they strangely agree that if something is stained, it has to be rejected, which is what the 1619 Project says. It says, because America is systemically racist, it's not worth defending. And I think the great question that we have to ask is one that was posed by Nietzsche in the 1880s. I'm, I'm not a fan of Nietzsche, but I think he has some brilliant insights. And he says in one place, suffering is not an argument against life meaning people do horrible things and endure horrible things. And the problem with what he called the last man, that's you and I, the exhausted men and women at the end of history, is that we see any suffering, any transgression, and we say life is refuted, there's nothing here worthwhile. But you with your composers know that there's something here worthwhile, notwithstanding that these, these uh, composers you know, may have had all sorts of sullied aspects of their personality, of their lives, involved in cultures which were, which were despicable in some ways, but, but that's not an argument ultimately against them because we have to start from, I think, and I think you start in the same place, from the understanding that we're broken human beings longing and hoping for redemption, uh, but we're not pure. And I think the modern mind wants to start with purity and then sees anything that's impure as an argument against life, whether it's the American founding or your composers, I think we have to start it the other way and, and say, no, it is impure. And that means anything that's beautiful, we need to cherish. Absolutely. And uh, I always tell my students that what connects us, what, the only thing that connects us is our imperfections, shared imperfections, we're all imperfect. We all have capacity to, to, we are not guaranteed from doing horrible things. Whereas the, it's all in us. Yes. And, and if we all put it on the kind of in the operation, like a surgeon in under the bright light under the table, all wounds of everybody, all imperfections and look at it in a very sober way maybe then there is a possibility of coming together or well, I'm too naive to talk about it. No, I, I think this is right. So I, I believe it was Solzhenitsyn who said, the line between good and evil runs through every man's heart. Meaning it's not, you're not gonna find evil people out there and declare that we're good, that every one of us is mixed. And, and if you actually stop blaming other people and saying they're the impure ones, I'm pure and innocent. If you stop doing that, then you're going to have to admit a measure of humility. And you're going to have to say, well, I have problems too. Um, I have, like you, I teach. So last year, one of my students in a class on conservatives and radicals had a conference call with me and was very disgusted with some of the comments that other people were making in class. And, and this person said, well, I can't talk with these people. I said, you need to take a good look at this person and you need to take a good look at everyone in your country and say, these are my fellow citizens. But you might not like them, but this is, you've been thrown into the world at this time, at this place, in this body, speaking this language, having these beliefs. And we don't really know why. There's a mystery here. But we can be pretty sure that this is our only chance with what we have to build a world together. And that means reaching out to people that you might not like and recognizing that like you, the line of good and evil goes through your heart too, not just theirs. Uh, but again, what we're trying to do is to separate 
uh, the pure from the from the damned here. The the comment that Hillary Clinton made about the the irredeemables and the deplorables. I think this is part of the reason why there's a, a kind of deep antipathy antagonism toward the elites in America is because the elites have made this judgment that the common people are stained and impure. That uh, you know to press the matter further, that the the only way to think in a healthy manner is to think be committed to cosmopolitanism, to universalism, and anybody who believes in their nation and their particular family and their particular religion, religion is somehow stained. So for example, people will say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Well, what does that mean? So to be religious is to be committed to something very sp specific, but that's imperfect. But if you're spiritual, you hover over the whole world. This problem first emerged um, in the French Revolution because the French Revolution was a revolution made in the name of universals, in the name of pure universals. And everything that was particular, the aristocracy, the church, uh, everything that was particular was viewed as stained. And of course, we know how the French Revolution ended with the terror. And, and what philosophers understood, Hegel and Tocqueville understood, and they wrote in the aftermath of it, was that this terror was necessary. There was no other alternative, because if you're committed to cosmopolitan, pure universality that's, that lifts you up above the stain of your nation and your family and your history, then the only possible response you can have to those who are committed to particularity is what was called the fury of destruction. And I think we're, we're engaged in that right now around the world. We've got a group of cosmopolitan elites who think that they can escape from the wounds of their history, and I'm thinking of Europe in particular, by renouncing their nations and being committed to the United Nations or the European Union. Uh, and so the people who want to hang on to their nations are seen as authoritarian, you know, the whole long list. Mm -hmm. And I don't doubt that there's some very sinister forces. So I'm not defending everyone who's defending their nation. There's certain forms of nationalism, which are very pernicious. But, but the idea that somehow to be committed to anything particular is a stain, your, your home, your family, uh, this is this is the pathology of our age right now, and and I think the, it's going to end very badly because <clears throat> what's happening is the two groups are pulling farther and farther apart. The universalists look at the people who want their nation and they look at the worst examples of it, and they say, "See, this is what you get. You get blood and soil nationalism and racism." And and the people on the right are saying, "Well." we're doing this, but look at what you're gonna have if you have the universalists, they're gonna destroy your nation, they're gonna destroy your families, they're gonna destroy your religion. And so you get these two sides just tearing at each other. I don't see how this resolves in a happy way. So to your original question, do I think there's doom here? I think we're gonna, something is gonna collapse because this pairing of particular and universal, it's not stable. And, and just one last thing, Tocqueville thought that there wasn't a way out, there was a way out of this. And that is, we have to build a world together in local communities. We have to have a limited but responsible love of our country so that we're not completely enclosed in talking about our own race, which is blood and soil nationalism. And neither are we so completely disembodied from our everyday life that we're committed to cosmopolitan values, which really mean you're committed to nothing. And here you led me to actually my next question that I wanted to ask you. I absolutely agree with you. And one remark that it seems that term that used in psychology, talking therapy, that's what we need, talking therapy, talking to each other, long form dialogue, which is long form. And my next question leads to another danger that I see that doesn't help us to come to this dialogue is everything becomes so immediate and so uh, like my good friend uh, Alex Zubatov says flattening of consciousness like we deny the past we disengage from the present because we live in virtual reality and yet we ori orient yourself, ourselves in some illusional horizon of utopian future. So we end up floating in this, I don't know what it is, 
delusional, oblivious, sub quasi uh, existence and um, how we ground ourselves. So one way of looking at this is that the analog world is the world of, of sequence of time and place. And the digital world is the timeless world. So I can push a button and, and you're in Minnesota and here I am on the Eastern shore of Maryland. It's a world certainly without space. Um, and, and the proof that it's a world without time, without sequence is how people respond on Twitter. If you had to live with the people that you're responding to on Twitter, you would never say the things that you do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so my, my brief answer is we have to return to the world of, of a time and place and, and duration. Um, this is why social media is so pernicious. You mentioned, I think you used the term long duration dialogue. And long form, like team form. and variations. It's right. like continuum. We yes. need that unfolding. Um, things slowly have to unfold in order to get some understanding. Like uh, Roland Barthes, my favorite, one of my favorite writers says, uh, I'm, if, I, I'm terrified of people with, who understand things too quickly. And he, he talks about drip by drip understanding like drip by drip filtering coffee versus instant coffee yeah i agree so i would put it this way let me add something to this so it's not only long form dialogue because you could say a university should be long form dialogue but i think it, it has to be long form dialogue in a lived com lived context mm -hmm. so uh so it's the long form dialogue of us continually working with our neighbors continuing working uh, at the level of local politics, lo local civic associations. Um, and when you do that, you build up this vast reservoir of trust, you build up competence, um, you get pulled out of yourself, uh, which is I think one of the great problems of the modern age is that we, we collapse inside of ourselves. So, so we know what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to build a world together in community. And as we said earlier, sometimes, you're gonna say horrible things to your neighbors and they're gonna say horrible things to you. But the next day you have to face them and you have to say, I'm sorry. Look, living in face-to-face -face relations in day-to-day -day life in long form is really, really hard. And so it's not an accident that we would search for shortcuts. And I think social media gives us a shortcut. But I think we need to be careful because I don't wanna say, let's get rid of the digital world. Uh, and go back and live in burlap bags in local communities. I don't own that. So I think we need to find a, a responsible way to think about this. And I have a suggestion for this. So I'm going to make the distinction between supplements and substitutes. Yes. So when you're having a meal, you can have a supplement, a vitamin, and it can enhance the meal and you can become healthier. But the vitamin, while it can be a supplement, cannot be a substitute for the meal because then you're gonna get sick. So let's do Facebook here. Facebook friends is an interesting term. It supposes that you know already what friendship is, that's the meal. And then through this digital venue, you can extend your understanding of friendship. So, so that Facebook is in a way the vitamin to the meal of friendship. And as long as the digital thing called Facebook is a supplement to the analog thing called the meal, then it can actually enhance our powers. The problem though, is that human beings are looking for shortcuts and it occurs to them that maybe we can bypass the meal, the hard work of figuring out what friendship is uh, and, and just go right to Facebook friends and have thousands of Facebook friends, but slowly but surely as you do that, you lose the difficult art of forming real friendships and then all those Facebook friends mean nothing. So the best example of this is to be found in, in an essay by Rousseau in 1751. It was, it's now called The First Discourse. Mm -hmm. And he says, ancient soldiers had courage, modern soldiers have strength. And what he meant by that was the ancients understood what courage was. And if you put on a weapon and you are courageous, you become fierce. But he said, the moderns are gonna look for cheap shortcuts. We're gonna look for strength, meaning more and more weapons. And we're gonna lose sight of the fact that we have to have courage to use the weapons well. 
And uh, you know, we can have lengthy debates about Afghanistan, but it was quite clear that we had all the military weapons in the world in Afghanistan, but we didn't have the courage, which seemed to be what the Taliban had. They were willing to fight and die. Uh, and again, I'm not, I don't wanna say go beyond that, but simply to indicate this is exactly what Rousseau saw would happen, that the modern world would look for cheap shortcuts. We would look for substitutes rather than supplements. So, so I think the right, right way to think about this analog digital thing that I'm saying is social media, all these things can be supplements and can empower us if we still develop in long form things like friendship and courage and love. And, and then we can use the digital medium. But because we're creatures who are longing for shortcuts, we say, I'm not gonna do that hard work of getting courageous and building friendships. I'm just gonna find the cheap substitute. I'm gonna spend hundreds of billions of dollars on weapons and I'm not gonna care if my soldiers have courage. I'm just gonna have as many Facebook friends as I can, but I'm not gonna even talk to my friends anymore. I'm not, we're not gonna go out and have coffee anymore. So I think that's the way we should look at it. Supplements can strengthen us, but if they turn into substitutes, that's a problem. Because I wanna have a responsible way to think about technology. We can't go back. Mm -mm. The question is what's our relationship to it? My question is, what about children? Uh, I'm lucky because both of my children, they're in their 20s, and they both not on social media. They both very much enjoying, they embodied reality to the maximum, and it, yeah. it was their decision. Uh, but what about younger children who are born already from age three? Two, from toddler age, they're born into this digital world. That's the only world they know. We have at least something, some retrospective. We yeah. have that analog of, okay, I know how real friendship feels. For them, that's the only thing that exists. Aura, I lose sleep over this. Uh, I think we're performing this unbelievably dangerous social experiment without even knowing it. And, and you, I think you just explained it quite well that you can have the digital as a supplement, but if you have a whole generation that's raised you know, from two years on futzing with tablets and living in a timeless, spaceless world, it's a problem. It shows up in a number of ways. So for example, our young people now are not being taught cursive writing. You know this, right? They're not being taught script. And so, you know, I'm, I don't mind having a typewriter. I use it all the time, or rather the, the digital screen, my laptop, but I learned cursive. And so the, the computer can be a supplement to my, my indwelt analog knowledge of how to write script. And I think when you do that, you can actually learn and remember. There's all sorts of studies now among, about uh, over kids who are so-called supposedly learning through tablets. You, learning involves all the senses. It involves your body. It means you have to turn the page. You have to feel the page. You have to smell the page. Smell, smell. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. So, and, and if you wanna have online readings as a supplement to that, I think that's fine. But part of the reason why our young people now have terrible memories is because our learning is not associated with the senses. So there are stories of you know, ancient American Indians who would, who would bring everybody to the campsite and tell the stories of the ancestors, but they drink a certain tea when they told the stories of the ancestors. And so then when you drink the tea, you're, you help recall later on the, the stories that were told. So, so learning is a whole body phenomena. And so what we're pretending is that, no, no, it's all through the screen. It can all be conveyed through the screen. This is a terrible social experiment. Again, I don't wanna suggest we go back to handwriting alone, mm -hmm. but I think that we have to understand as technology gets more sophisticated, that the, the proper way to educate then would be to start at the beginning at the primitive cursive and then, and then fine, we can go all the way, but we can't skip the hard work step. And it's a lot of hard work to teach kids how to do cursive, to learn their letters. We can't skip the steps. And, and I think to come back to your first question, doesn't it feel like everything's falling apart? One explanation for why everything is falling apart is that we've been bypassing the hard work of, of cursive, of friendship, of courage, relying, turning supplements into substitutes. And sooner or later, because you can't 
turn a supplement into substitute. You have to have the substantial analog knowledge. Sooner or later, the whole ca uh, ca castle collapses around you because the foundation is this invisible tacit knowledge that can only be developed in long form in our local communities, in our families. Through practice. Yes. And that's so why I, I'm behind. thinking about practicing an instrument yes. or practicing cooking, the process yes. of not even eating the real meal, but cooking from scratch. It's, it's becoming almost critical for our survival, uh, intellectual sur developmental survival. So uh, on those lines, I just have a quick story to tell. I, I, uh, my mother's older sister was born in 1915. She was a child of the depression and the family went through great poverty. And when you had poverty assistance in the 1930s in America, you got flour, eggs, butter, and milk. That's what you got. And then, then you cooked it because the idea was you had to have a kind of competence in order to, to become a successful citizen. And we're not gonna give you pre-baked meals or you know, stovetop stuffing or whatever it is where you don't have to do, open a can and there's your meal or put it in the microwave. Whereas now, uh, you know, there's poverty assistance ought to be helping people develop competence, but along the food line, you can use food stamps to buy anything. And so you don't at all have to develop the competence of having a meal. Well, what could be more important when you're trying to develop a life that's sound and substantial uh, to block out things like cooking, to block out things like making your bed in the morning, these basic human skills which are so necessary in order to develop competence. And again, we can't escape the web of poverty if you don't have these competencies. And, and my, my aunt would talk about the noble poor. To be poor, you, mean, you never didn't want to take too much from the government, but it would never cross your mind to do more than accept butter, buttermilk, uh, flour, uh, and eggs, because it was understood that you could get yourself out of this, you would develop the competence, you'd have cooking for your family, and, and this was how you're going to beat this. It yeah. was orientation toward self-reliance. Yes. Not yeah. toward reliance. And here is my next question, because I'm observing children and students, and I'm going to present this Saturday in Heterodox Academy Conference, and I'm going to talk about certain things. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, it seems that it's crucial to reorient at least next generation and ourselves from protecting ourselves from life to developing tools to face challenges of life. But what educational systems, including academia do, they keep forcefully young minds in kindergarten instead of letting them grow and be born like Eric Fromm said, many people die before they're fully born. And it takes creativeness to be fully born before you die. So we don't allow people to become fully born, to, to, to realize themselves, the human potential, if you go to big words. So I, I'm always thinking in terms of the history of ideas, so I'll just give you two. So Rousseau who was a bit crazy in some ways, but he had some brilliant things to say in a later book in 1759 called Emile. He's very concerned about the very thing we're concerned about today, namely students who are coddled. Uh, he says, how can I teach my student the art of living who's afraid of dying? You have to expose children, you have to let them fall down on their faces this is very, very important. And already Rousseau could see in the 1750s that the softening of Western civilization would produce a new generation of children who we would coddle and protect. So it, the book is Emile. You, it'd be important, I think, for people to look at this again. Then let me tell you one other figure who was writing about the same time. Um, Immanuel Kant says, and he's concerned about how it is you can get actual historical development of the human species. And he says, well, nature is going to push us. And then he says, and this is a line that, that, that frightens my students. Kant says, nature does not care one little bit about your happiness. Nature wants you to develop competence, right? And to develop competence, 
you know this, or you've got a piano behind you. You're a professional musician. Practice is hard work. Sometimes it's not fun. The most important things we do in life are not fun. I took two years away from Georgetown and from 2008 to 2010 and went off to Kurdistan in post-war Iraq uh, and, and ran the only successful, I think, enterprise in all of post-war Iraq, which is the American University of Iraq there. It was very, very difficult. Uh, the, all, the, all the housing had terrible sewage problems. We poured kerosene down the toilets to keep that smell away. There were cockroaches everywhere. I had a jaw infection for five months. I went to the hospital and there was blood all over the floor. And I said, I'm not gonna go there. And so I endured an infection. I lost some part of my jaw. And people said, well, that must've been really fun going to Iraq, but that was a really uh, wonderful experience. I said, no, it was the worst experience of my life, but it was the most important experience of my life. You, you, you grow through hardship and suffering. And suffering is not an argument against life, as we said a few minutes ago. But we've, what we've raised a group of children who are so, so incompetent, so frightened to do anything. And, and I blame both the professional class who want incompetent infants who need them. Yes, so therapists, et cetera. But I, but I will say I also blame parents because the right thing for a parent to do is to help your child not need you anymore. But if you keep them perpetually from injury, then they will need you forever. But the meaning of your life cannot be your children. The meaning of life, the, the, you know, Khalil Gibran says, you know, the children belong to the future. And in some ways that's silly, but in some ways it's true. You know, we're to shepherd them and to hand them on to the future, but they're not ours to possess and to form. Uh, but, but we have a whole generation now of young people who are frightened to death of anything controversial. Uh, I don't worry about this in my own class. I teach history of Western ideas, Western political thought at Georgetown. I, I don't worry about it so much because I, I just tell them straight up, listen, if you, if you don't go to bed, go home tonight and fall into bed with a great big headache, wondering what it is you just heard that just turned your world upside down, then I have failed. And we have to constantly press our, our young people forward. And that's the way they become happy. It's funny because my students tell me after first class, or you put us through existential crisis. <laughs> but I do it on purpose. Yes. <laughs> because we, it, otherwise we lose absolute immunity that protects us from hardships, from anything that goes our way. And... Um, yeah. But <sighs> I find it's very hard for young generation to develop this because they are so dependent on the image. That's another thing I wanted to talk with you about, the obsession with self-image versus authentic self, whatever. I, 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 I'm cautious using the word authentic. Uh, yeah. But to me, the image and the self are different things or uh, gender identity or other things. Yeah. Um, it's not the self, it's something else. So that's another substitution going on here, I think. What are you yes. thinking about it? I, I agree. So, um, so we, we all have an idealized image of who we are. And it gets torn apart each and every day of our lives, as it should. Uh, what digital media allows you to do is to present that image and, and present only that image. And so you say, you know, all the great things you did on your vacation and how, how everybody in your family is just doing perfectly well. And nobody can challenge you on it. And if they do, you can defriend them. And then another thing, which I think is terribly important, which nobody talks about, is uh, the distinction, or should I put this, young people are using text messages rather than phone calls. And this is part of the problem. So if you're gonna have a phone call, then you're gonna say something spontaneous and it's gonna probably be, some of it's gonna be stupid and some of it might be malicious. And, and then you're gonna to have to constantly auto-correct and your image of yourself gets broken when you have to live in real time, yes? But when you text message, you can wait until you're in a perfectly good mood, right? Uh, you don't have to respond in real time. And I ask my students 
who claim that they're these people who are gonna transform the world, I say, do you live in real time or in virtual time? And my test of this is I ask them, will they spontaneously call up their friend and say, let's go do something? Very few of them do this. They all text message because they're frightened of interrupting. Uh, they're, because everybody has to have this perfect shell and they don't even want the other person's shell to be broken. They don't want them to yell at, at, you, at yourself for trying to contact them. So, so the, 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 the self-image, what I call selfie man, by the way, that's my turn. We've, we've all developed into selfie man where mm -hmm. we present ourselves you know, with the world as our background. I, I told my students the other day that it is philosophically important that 500 million selfies are taken a day in around the world, maybe more, maybe a billion. I have no idea. But what, what is a selfie picture? A selfie is I'm the most important thing and the world itself is my backdrop. I mean, that is an extraordinary claim about how important you are, right? So my view is, sure, we have these imaged, imagined views of who we are. Sometimes they can pull us onward and they can be healthy because they say, no, this is the standard to which I must rise. And that, that can be wonderful. But if they're instead pictures of our pictures of pride and narcissism, then I think they're deeply destructive. And so my view is we're going to have to go back to real time, long form. And that's the only cure for this. And my students say, well, I don't want to do that because it's too painful. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a response to that. And, and the response is, well, how's it working for you? Because the way it is working for them is while they have a kind of a re a reprieve, like a safe space from which they can uh, protect themselves from the infractions of the world, in order to be happy, we have to build a world with other people. And so they get a kind of false happiness from not from, from their fragility and from the insulation from the world. But I say to them, look at the whole of your life. You have moments where you can breathe a sigh of relief because you're not doing hard things, but you're also incredibly unhappy and you're taking drugs. And, and so many of our young people today are on mind numbing drugs because the pain of their loneliness is so great. And I say to them, the only way out of this is if you, uh, is if you face real time life. I had a student two years ago, I was in the Middle East, a cuttery woman, fully, fully uh, covered in an abaya. And she came into me one day and she said, Professor Mitchell, I, I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm getting attacked on social media. I'm on, I'm on Instagram, eight, 10 hours a day, you know, what do I do? And I said, quit, just erase all the accounts after you leave my office. And I argued with her for an hour and she finally said, okay, I will do it. And she did it. And four weeks later, she came to me and said, I had no idea how depressed and unhappy I was with all my social media accounts. Now I only talk to people in real time and I feel life returning to my soul. So you've got a younger generation that on the one hand thinks it wants these protections, but in point of fact is so profoundly unhappy. And so I think the question we have to ask is, how is that working for you? And if you catch them in a moment of honesty, they'll say, there's something so seriously wrong with this and I don't even know how to begin to extract myself from it. Yes. And um, especially when we talked about, you said the weakening of the family, but I observe even in a classroom that boys terrified of girls and girls terrified of boys. I'm not going into gender issues, but I'm talking sure. about just they're afraid to even approach each other, not to mention yeah. dating and falling in love and forming relationships. So, so here I think um, Alexis de Tocqueville saw the problem in this wonderful book called Democracy in America. And, and his argument is this, he says, we're moving from the aristocratic age to the democratic age. 
And the aristocratic age is characterized by formalities, by roles, by protocols. And as we move to the democratic age, all that gets erased. And he said, What's, what is also going to happen is we're in aristoc aristocracies. We know that there are distinctions between men and women. When you get to the age of democracy, the age of equality, when everything must be completely equal, you get the claims that men and women are literally the same kind of thing. They're, they're not. They're, there's no they're different species. <laughs> yeah, thank you. This is what I say. And that's the beauty of it. And that's why we, we <laughs> need each other. Or we're on the same page, but it's us against the world, I'm sorry to say. But so put all this together and you get these two creatures who are different species. And I use that exact phrase. These two creatures who are different species. All the formalities have been destroyed. Uh, and, and so as a consequence, if you ask young people, are they dating? What they generally say is something like this. Well, it's complicated. And what they mean by that is, I can't even use the term dating because that's so old fashioned. So I have no, I can't even name what we are. And, and therefore I can't, I can't uh, press what we're doing into this box called dating. And so it's an absolute mess. And uh, the problem is for a civilization to reproduce itself, we have to have generation in families between men and women. We have to have it. And if you, if you have these two creatures who have no way of, of understanding one another, then, then marriages can't last and children are gonna be harmed. And so the test for me, the test for me when I ask young men or young women how their marriage is, I say uh, to the women, do you insist that your husband is there when you're giving birth to a child? And if they're co-equals, generally speaking, the women will say, well, I, absolutely, the man must be there. And in and, and my view, and perhaps it's hopelessly old fashioned is that actually not. And I've been through two of these with, with my two boys. Uh, and, and my view is, no, there are, there are domains of experience that women should have with, with their mothers, their sisters, and their nurse midwives and their doctors. Uh, but there are certain things that, that they have to be separate. And what young people today want to do is they say, I want my best friend, right? I want my husband or wife to be my best friend. And while I think that's partly true and, and it can grow and develop, my own sense of this is that we have to return to some understanding that men and women are a bit of a mystery to one another. And that we need some formalities in here uh, to help help us smooth over something that's otherwise impossible. It reminds me of Goya, Francisco Goya, famous two paintings, Maya naked and Maya dressed. <laughs> so we need to be a little bit dressed, Thank you. as you said. Yeah. And, and maybe it will help us to connect more intimately with our manhood or our womanhood, which is a wonderful thing. Yes, so uh, you use the word authenticity, <coughs> but you are reluctant to use it. And, I, and I'm reluctant to use it too, because, <coughs> excuse me, um, <clears throat> here's the question. Do we want transparency in human relations or, or a workable, translucence. Translucence is you can sort of see, right? There's, remember, there's to be opaque, translucent, and transparent, yes? And we don't want to be opaque, but I think in the modern age, we want to destroy all formalities, uh, all, all the boundaries between us, and we want to be transparent. Everybody's got to tell the truth, spill their guts, uh, say anything that comes to their mind, and that's being authentic. <laughs> in my view, which is an older view, is that no, we need a workable translucence, by which I mean, we actually honor each other's depth by not pretending we can penetrate to the bottom of it. When we search for authenticity, the supposition is that we can actually understand, a man can understand a woman's depth and a woman can understand a man's depth. 
But if there is real depth here, it defies words. It's deeper than words can know, deeper than words can say. And so it, in some ways we honor and respect the mystery of our difference through translucence rather than through transparency, which is not to say we're opaque. We, we make a modest effort to try, but we also know that we're, we're, we're in effect two different life forms, two different mysterious kinds of creatures. Uh, and that honors us when we don't try to reach to the bottom of it, because there's knowledge that's deeper than words can say. And truth slightly veiled yes. is more enchanting the truth into your face. Yes. So Edmund Burke, who wrote uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France, said this French Revolution, which was, marks the beginning of the new era, stripped away what he called the decent drapery of life, all the veilings, okay? And to have a decent civilization, things have to be veiled. But once you step into this revolutionary frame of mind, you wanna strip away all the illusions, all the veils, to have authenticity and absolute transparency. But the question is whether human beings are, are, are deep enough or so deep that we can never know ourselves. This is what I keep telling my students who wanna declare that they have this or that identity. Identity is a statement that's, that, uh, that, that uh, makes it impossible to have a conversation. This is who I am, this is my identity, you must respect it. And I say to them, every great author who's truly great understood that we don't yet know who we are. There's a labor here that, that uh, must involve, that involves us in all these human relations through which we begin to discover who we are. But here again, identity politics, identity is a shortcut. Oh, this is who I am. And you've got plenty of professionals out there who will make up all these different identities and say, well, your problem is you're, you're just this identity. And once you understand that you're this identity, then everything's gonna be fine. And then, and then young people step into those identities and say, well, that's the answer to my problem. There's no identity that's an answer to your problem because we're deeper than any proclamation about who we are. And coming back to the competence and mastery, when I go to doctor to have a surgery or to dentist to fix my teeth, I don't care about dentist identity or gender. I care about what kind of professional he or she is. Yes. So this is absolutely right. And, and in my understanding right now, I think we have two choices going forward. We can either build a world of competence where we do discover who we are with others, and we also advance science and we come to understand nature better and maybe be better stewards of nature. And there's no limit to what we can do if we, if we focus on competence. We can do the politics of competence or we can do what I call the politics of innocence, identity politics, where the only thing we care about is defending this or that identity. And, and my view is that's a, that's a recipe, first of all, for civil unrest. Um, and secondly, and people don't like it when I say this, only a, only a hegemonic power can do this because the world is never ending competition, which means you always have to have competence at the front of your, front of your mind. And only a world power that has no competition can even indulge this fantasy that we can do away with competence and start talking about whether we're innocent or guilty. And, and so I think it's not an accident that this identity politics stuff has emerged after 1989, when America emerged as a unipolar power. When you don't have any competition, you don't have to worry about competence. I, I dimly remember the early 60s. And of course there was this Sputnik moment for America. The Russians had put up a satellite. We were mm -hmm. in a real competition here. And, and the whole of my early education was, was all about math and science. Nobody cared whether you're a man, a woman, black or white, they did not care. Can you do the math? Can you do the science? Can you do the chemistry? That's how we were pushed. And, and, you, and you have to think about competence when you're in competition with other nations because you could die if you don't. Uh, but, but only in a, in a so-called post-war world where the US is a hegemonic power, can you indulge this fantasy of identity politics. All that to say that, that eventually, if you don't pay attention to competence, your world standing diminishes 
And here, strangely enough, I do think China is gonna be the gift that keeps on giving because as China makes advances in science and technology, it takes the space front, takes the space horizon and, and controls it and owns it. There'll be a very harsh Sputnik-like wake up moment in America. And I think that's one of the reasons why we will put down this identity politics stuff. It will be a matter of survival. Yes. So it will push us to wake up. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And in here, remember Kant, nature does not care about your happiness. She cares about your competence. And we're supposed to be happy with these identity politics categories. And, and Kant says, no, nature cares only that you keep going and developing your competence. And, and your happiness is not, not the call here. It's not what's most important. I agree. <laughs> Well, Josh, uh, it's getting late for you more than for me because you are ahead of me. Yes. yes. It's, it's amazing to keep talking to you and I hope we can continue one day. Of course. Of course. And um, with not extremely optimistic, I think... I very much appreciate Viktor Frankl's concept of tragic optimism. I think yes. um, we say yes to life despite yeah. despite everything. <laughs> yeah, we need if we if our civilization can return to that, we can endure and overcome the problems we face. If we cannot, we will fail. Amen. <laughs> to that, to it. Yes. So, thank you so much. My pleasure, Aura. Let's, let's talk again, okay? We will. Okay. Thank you. Let me... Uh...